Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse number 25. And a certain woman which had an issue of blood twelve years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing better, but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment, for she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway, everybody said straightway. straightway. In Oki, that means right then. All right. The fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus immediately, there's another one of those right now words. Immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace, and be whole of thy plague. John chapter 1. Verses 1 and 2, and then we'll read verse 14. John chapter number 1, verses 1 and 2. And then we'll read verse 14. Good to meet Brother Jackson also for the first time tonight. In the beginning was the Word. Everybody said the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Now, in verse 14, he gives us a little more clarification on the identity of the Word. He said, And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Somebody tell me his name. Jesus. Jesus. Now, in Mark chapter 5, we saw where a woman with the issue of blood, touched the garment of the Lord Jesus Christ, whom the Scripture identifies as the Word made flesh. And when she touched him, virtue flowed out of him into her, and she received her healing. Tonight, with the help of the Lord, I want to preach from this subject, drawing the virtue out of the Word. Drawing the virtue out of the Word. Listen, this church is built on the Word of God. Brother Phillips came here nine years ago preaching one God, Jesus' name, Holy Ghost. He's still preaching it, and God is adding to the church such as should be saved. And tonight, you need to know that in the Word is enough virtue to meet whatever need you may have. And we're going to talk about drawing the virtue out of the Word. Let's pray and ask God to help us. Father, we love you. We thank you for your mercy tonight. Thank you, God, for nine years of truth being preached in this city. Thank you for every life that has been touched and all of the virtue that has gone out. We pray tonight, Lord, that you would confirm your word with signs following. In Jesus' name, do mighty things among us, God, as we connect our faith with your word and virtue flows. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, the Lord bless you, and you can be seated. Now, the Word of God that we have in front of us tonight, perhaps you have your Bible sitting on your lap or on the pew beside you. This is unlike any other book that has ever been written. To the secular mind, it is simply a compilation of histories and wisdom and poetry, prophetic utterances, correspondence from apostles to churches. Some say it's nothing but myths and fairy tales. But we tonight who are gathered here in the name of Jesus Christ, in the presence of our God, know that it's a lot more than that. Every book contains something of the personality and uh, the knowledge and the identity of the author. 
But I'm going to tell you, this book tonight goes beyond and transcends those norms. Because not only do we find the knowledge of the author and, and the nature of the author and the ways of the author and the wisdom of the author, but in this book contained in its holy precepts are not only that wisdom and that knowledge and that personality, but the power and virtue and ability of Almighty God himself resonates within the pages of God's book and when it is spoken under the anointing of the Holy Ghost all of the potential of God's creative power is ready to be loosed if faith connects with the word amen the Bible said for the word is quick and powerful. That word quick in the, New in the Old Testament, or the New Testament rather, King James, doesn't talk about speed. It means that word is alive. The word is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Many have been the times that I have come to the house of God, and the man of God stood up to preach and it felt like a searchlight was shining right on me and every dark corner of my heart was illuminated and I used to wonder when I was a child has my mama been talking to the preacher but I've learned over the years that nobody in flesh has to talk to the preacher because when the word of God starts going forth it can pierce even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and discern the very thoughts and the very intents of your heart I've had things preached on me and things preached off of me I've had things preached in me and thank God some things preached out of me but I thank God that there have been men of God in my life that did not care what I thought they weren't worried about my feelings or my self esteem they wanted me to make a heaven my home and so when they stood behind this sacred desk they opened God's word and preached without fear and without favor I thank God tonight that this word can discern the thoughts and intents of the heart Jesus said in John 6 verse 63 the words that I speak unto you they are spirit and they are life he said they're spirit and they are life God's words are like containers for his power and when you speak the word of God, there is power, there is virtue, there is dynamic force that is loosed in your life. The words in this book are charged with the life and the power and the virtue of the author. They are as alive and as powerful today as they were when they crossed the lips of Jesus Christ or when the prophets put the quill to the scroll under the unction of the Holy Ghost. They are just as real and just alive today as they ever were. Hallelujah. John identified Jesus as the Word made flesh amen he went on to say about the word that in him was light and in him was life excuse me and the life was the light of men now that means that God's word contains both light and life I'm glad that it doesn't just bring light because if that's all that it did, we would be of all men most frustrated. Let me explain to you what I'm trying to say. The light of the Word of God shines on our sin. It shines on our inadequacies. And it shines also on the path that we are to walk. It lets us know we got to get out of the sinning business and get on that straight and that narrow path and change our lives through repentance. But if that's all that it did was just pour out our inadequacies and, and identify our sin and, and even then show us the road that we need to walk, we would be so frustrated because within this flesh dwelleth no good thing. But I'm glad the Word doesn't just shine the light on that pathway. 
the same word that shines the light also has life in it and when the light shines God also imparts the life in his word that empowers me to walk on the pathway that the light points out it doesn't just tell me I need to quit lying and drinking and smoking and, and fornicating and cheating and stealing but it empowers me to pick myself up out of that miry clay it empowers me live right and walk right and talk right it contains both light and life illumination enlightenment and virtue and empowerment something happens when the word of God is preached and you receive it yes it brings knowledge yes it brings illumination yes you see what you need to do but that's not the end I'm telling you when God's word is preached that is one of the ways that God has of imparting his grace into your life and imparting his power into your life he doesn't just tell you you need to repent he gives you the grace to get up from where you are and make your way to an altar and lay it all out before him hey friend I'm telling you tonight whatever need you may have whatever the light may reveal the life that's in the word is going to empower you to do it amen in Mark's gospel we read of one woman's encounter with the word and how it absolutely changed her very life this was a woman who was acquainted with suffering, not only physical, but emotional and spiritual because her infirmity encompassed every meaningful aspect of her life. Because of the law of Moses that they lived under in that day, not only did she have the physical uh, suffering and the pain and the humiliation of her condition to deal with, but she was cut off from having any human contact with friends and family and, and could not enter into the temple of the Lord because of her condition. For 12 years, the Bible said she suffered many things of many physicians and was nothing bettered but rather grew worse cut off from human contact cut off from spiritual contact pain and physical weakness and humiliation day in and day out for 12 long weary years and then the Bible said she heard about Jesus I don't know how she heard about him we're not given that information but thank the Lord for somebody that let a seed drop on fertile ground you never know where it's going to go when you tell somebody about what God's done for you. And the scripture said that she got to talking to herself. She said within herself, now let me tell you something, it matters what you say when you talk to yourself. Because the voice you hear the most often is your own. Sometimes I don't just talk to myself, I answer back. I've been in a spot a time or two, that's the only way I could get any intelligent conversation. But she got to talking to herself and said, I, I think if I could just get close enough to touch his clothes. Now I'm telling you, and don't misunderstand what I'm getting ready to say, but she didn't have a single scripture to base that on. There was not one prophecy in the Old Testament that said, if you touch the hem of Messiah's garment, you'll be healed. But this woman got to talking to herself. And the more she talked faith to herself, the stronger it built. And I'm going to tell you something about God. God has a hard time ignoring faith. There's times that God is more interested in meeting needs than he is in picking apart the hairs of theology. I didn't say truth doesn't matter. There's only one way to God, and you better find it in your Bible. But friend, what I'm talking about is there are times when somebody has a need in their life. It might not always be according to protocol. They might want to come running up right in the middle of a song service, and that might not be the done thing where you go to church. But I'm going to tell you something. There's something that bothers us a lot more than it bothers God. Because his compassion is greater than our, than our love for our tradition sometimes. And she got to talking to herself and said, if I can just touch his clothes. Now, nobody had ever done that before. 
This never had happened, Brother Talbert. I mean, Jesus had called people out and spoken to them and done things different ways, but nobody had ever just slipped up behind him and touched the hem of his garment and received their healing. But sometimes faith reaches into new areas. You might find yourself in a spot you've never been before. As a matter of fact, we call Abraham the father of the faithful. You know one reason I believe that God was so impressed with Abraham's faith? Because Abraham believed God for something God never had demonstrated his ability to do yet. The Bible said, by faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that received the promises offered up his only begotten son, accounting that he was faithful to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. I'm going to tell you something. In early Genesis, God never had raised anybody from the dead yet. Now, we can believe for that. We can look back in the Gospels, and we can look back. Oh, God's done that over and over again. But nobody had ever been raised from the dead yet. And I don't read where God ever promised Abraham he would raise him from the dead. Abraham just said, well, you know what? If I offer him on this altar and he dies, God will just raise him from the dead. Abraham's faith plowed into brand new territory, just like this little woman's faith did. I don't know, somebody might tonight plow some faith in new areas that you've never reached into before. But she had no hope left. The doctors couldn't help her. There was nothing that medical science of the day, such as it was, could do for her. But she got to talking to herself, and she said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment. If I can just touch the hem of his garment. Now, I've heard it preached that, that she wrestled and fought and pressed her way through the crowd. And then I've heard other men say that all she had to do was whisper, I'm unclean, and people stepped aside. I'm not really sure how it happened. I, I just know one thing, one way or another, she made her way to Jesus. Whatever it took, I happen to think she probably just shouldered her way through because the Bible said people were thronging around him and he didn't know who it was that touched him. So I, I kind of think that her little weak body, she reached down somewhere in the reserves of herself and found enough gumption to push her way through that crowd that was thronging him. And when she touched the hem of his garment, the very thing that her faith had, had claimed, the Bible said that virtue went out of him. And she knew in herself. Aren't you glad for something you could know in yourself? Jesus turned around and said, who touched me? The disciples said, Lord, you know, there's folks touching you all around. How can you ask a question like that? No, he said, this is a different kind of touch because virtue, virtue flowed out of me. And he looked around until he spotted her. And she knelt weeping and fearing, and she told him all the truth. And he said, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Let me tell you something. She had no precedent to base her faith on, but it grew in the soil of desperation until finally it demanded action. And it became alive. And when she pressed through every obstacle that was in her way and touched the hem of his garment, virtue flowed out of him and she knew that she was healed. I'm going to tell you tonight that in the word of God, there is enough virtue on deposit. There's an account with your name on it and there's plenty of God's virtue on deposit. And if you can connect your faith to God's word, there is no limit to what can happen in your life, in your family, in your home, in your body, or in your situation. Because our God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ever ask or think. You know, there was another one. Brother Talbert, get your Bible, if you would, please, and get you a microphone. Matthew chapter number 20, chapter number 15, please. And I want you to get ready to read for me, if you would. <clears throat> we'll start reading in verse number 22. Now, I want to talk to you just for a minute first while he's getting there. That woman, I want you to notice that she didn't hang back and wait for the word to come and call her out. She could have sat passively by and said, well, you know, if he really is God manifest in the flesh, then he knows what I need and he can come to me. 
Come on. You know what? There may have been somebody in the crowd with that attitude. We don't know. We don't read about them. They didn't make it into the chapter. This woman didn't have that kind of attitude and spirit. She said, I'm not going to wait for him to come to me. I'm not waiting for the word to come to me. I'm going to the word. Hallelujah. She had an aggressive attitude. She was the aggressor in that situation. Brother Talbot, read for us. Matthew 15, starting verse number 22. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast, cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David, my daughter, is grievously vexed with the devil. Now, in the first place, this was a woman of Canaan. She was not an Israelite. Brother Jackson, really, she had no right to be asking him anything right then. Come on. There was the great gulf of a dispensational barrier that stood between her and him. Right. For some reason, she didn't feel like obeying the rules that night or that day. <laughs> Read on, Brother Talbert. But he answered her not a word. Now, Jesus just didn't say anything. He just kept going on his way like she didn't even exist. Read on. His disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. The disciples came and said, Oh, let's run her off. She's crying after us. Read on. But he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep. Of the house of Israel. Now at this point, Jesus was trying to be kind. He he started out just ignoring her, and now he just said, Listen, I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. What did she do? Then she came and worshiped him, saying, oh. Lord, help me. Now wait a minute. First of all, he started out by ignoring her. Then he kind of brushed her off, and her response was worship. Hallelujah, hallelujah. He ignored her, and then he brushed her off, and her response was worship. Boy, we can stop and preach there a long time. I have pastored a few folks that it took less than that to hinder their worship. Read on, Brother Talbert. But he answered and said, It is not meat to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. Oh, boy, now he's really getting tough. He's pulling out the big guns. He said, It's not meat to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. Now, right about then is where some of us would have packed up and went back to Canaan. Right. To our devil-possessed daughter in our home still in turmoil and our life still in a mess and no hope. But I'm going to tell you a little secret. If you let the word offend you, you'll be gone when it comes virtue time. If you let the word offend you, you won't be around for the virtue to flow to. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I, I really don't believe Jesus was insulting her just to be rude. I'll tell you what, I, Brother Price, I'm going to tell you, Elder, what I really believe, and I stand to be corrected. But I think the Lord looked at her, and he saw that her desperation was so great that there was nothing he could say or do that was going to offend her. And he knew there's a lesson here that my people are going to need to know throughout the ages. And that's why he pushed it just a little bit farther so he could illustrate just what can happen in your life when you are willing to hang in there and stay with the word no matter how rough it gets and no matter how it rubs your flesh the wrong way. Hey, my friend, if you'll hang in there through the offensive part, you'll still be in position when miracles happen. You'll still be there at the station when virtue flows. But if you let the word offend you, you'll go back to the hell you came from without having your need met and without your miracle because you didn't have enough gumption to stick with the word. Yeah. What happened? And she said, truth, Lord, yet truth, dogs, Lord. The dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. The dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Read on. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, O woman, great is thy faith. Great is thy faith. Be it unto thee even as thou wilt. 
And what was the result? And her daughter was made, her daughter whole, from was made whole from that very hour. Hey, folks, let me tell you something. There's virtue in the word. There is power in the word. But if you let the word offend you, you're going to be long gone when the virtue flows. But if you get the attitude that says, preach to me, preacher, it doesn't matter how strong you have to make it. It doesn't matter how, how hard you have to get. I'm going to hang in there with the word, friend. You'll still be there when the virtue starts flowing. You'll be in perfect position for a miracle when it comes virtue time. Praise God. Oh, I'm telling you, God is good, isn't he? You know, there's another thing I want to address tonight. Jesus said it's not me to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. Come here, Brother Jackson. You're an evangelist. You preach all over the country. I want to ask you to confirm something. I, I've evangelized. I've preached around here and there a little bit. Have you found that people are across our fellowship many times, they see healing and miracles and deliverance as, as something way up high on the spiritual budget over in that part of the menu we don't even look at because we can't afford? They, 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 they seem to feel like that, you know, maybe if I was as spiritual as I ought to be, or maybe if I was prayed up like I ought to be, God could heal me, or God could meet my need. But do you know what Jesus called the miraculous? He didn't call it the children's filet mignon. That's good. That's good. <clears throat> he didn't call it the children's ribeye and shrimp and lobster tails. He said it's the children's bread. And you know what Jesus said? He said, if your son asks you for a piece of bread, are you going to give him a stone? Paul said that if we don't provide as earthly fathers for our children, that we've denied the faith and we're worse than an infidel. Do you think that God is going to put a requirement on me as an earthly father that he will not hold himself accountable to as my heavenly father? I'm going to tell you something. Miracles are not beyond our budget. Healings are not too expensive for us. I want you to know that it's the children's bread tonight. And if you are a child of your heavenly father, don't you ever feel embarrassed to go to him and say, I need a miracle. I need a healing for my body. I need deliverance in my home. I need provision for my family because it is the children's bread and he is your father. And when you ask your father for a piece of bread, he's not going to give you a stone. When you ask him for a fish, he's not going to give you a scorpion. When you ask him for an egg, he's not going to hand you a serpent. He is our heavenly father and he'll provide for us. Hey, friend, the miraculous Miraculous is not beyond our budget. It is the children's bread. I said it's the children's bread. You know, in the New Testament, there are at least three different and distinct operations of the miraculous that took place simultaneously and spontaneously while the word was being preached. In Acts chapter 8, Philip went to Samaria. And the Bible said he preached Christ unto them. Now let me say, I believe in prayer lines. We may have one tonight. I believe in anointing with all the scripture bears that out. I believe in all of that stuff. But I'm going to tell you something. The Bible said that many that were sick of the palsies and of lame were healed. And devils crying out came out of many. And you know the only thing going on? Philip was preaching Christ unto them. There were devils that came out while the word was being preached. There was deliverance that was wrought while the word was being preached. There were healings and crippled folks that were healed while Philip preached Christ unto them. I'm telling you, miracles can happen before the altar service ever comes along. And I'm persuaded that many times it does, and we're not even aware of it. But God can do the miraculous while the word is being preached. In Acts chapter 10, the Bible said, While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. I want to be very careful tonight, and I don't want to be too controversial. 
and I'm thankful for how God uses different individuals and I'm glad that no two ministries are the same and variety is the spice of life and all that but I'm going to tell you something we need to lose this attitude that we can't have miracles and the gifts of the spirit unless we've got the superstar evangelist uh, that's used in that gift I'm going to tell you all you need for those things to happen uh, is for the word to be present uh, and your faith to reach out and connect to it uh, I believe when things are as they ought to uh, there can be miracles when just God's people uh, and God's word get together uh, and faith connects and virtue flows I don't say that to denigrate any man that God uses that way. I don't say it at all because I've seen God do that myself. But I'm going to tell you something. I believe in faith. is as it should be. While the word is going forth, you don't have to wait for somebody to discern your backache or your high blood pressure or your diverticulitis. You can reach up and get in the hold of the hem of his garment. And while faith is being spoken, the miraculous can work in your life. We get our thinking sometimes in little boxes based on our experiences and just what we hear. But I'm going to tell you something. I believe there is a peak of Mount Everest, even though I've never been there and I'm not likely to ever go there. But I believe there is one. And just because you've never experienced something, if it's in God's word, that don't make it not real. You need to understand I know there's people from different churches here tonight. But when your pastor stands up to preach, that is not the time for you to sit back and relax and balance your checkbook and file your fingernails and play with the babies in front of you and flip through the back of the songbook. My, 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 that's the time that you need to be on the edge of your seat just waiting for that man of God to say something that connects uh, with your situation uh, so that you can jump up and grab a hold uh, of the hem of mercy's garment uh, and uh, hang on till virtue flows. Do you know what I've learned? Every time I have ever gone to God's house desperate for a word, I've always gotten one. Every time when I get desperate, God always answers. You know, there is something about hunger. Do you know when Hannah went to church with a desire so strong? There was a priest there in the tabernacle that day that was carnal and half backslid and all out of touch and out of tune with God. In fact, when she was there lost in travail, the priest thought she was drunk. It had been so long since he'd prayed that he didn't even recognize the depth of agonizing prayer when he saw it. He thought she was drunk. That's how far gone he was. But God loves his people so much that that woman's hunger pulled a prophetic word out of that backslidden preacher. And he said, next year, you're going to have that son you want. You want to know how powerful virtue can be drawn if your hunger and your faith are deep enough and strong enough. Nothing and nobody will stand in the way of God speaking to you. I have gone as a pastor, and I'm not proud of this, I have gone feeling empty and like I had nothing much to give the people. But Elder Price, because of the hunger of precious saints of God, I felt something begin to well up in me that didn't necessarily come from the reserve of my personal consecration. But because of God's love to feed his sheep, I, there was something that came forth and God's people were fed. Hey, I'm going to tell you something. When you come to the house of God and you've got to have a word and you can't live without one, honey, get both ears and your heart wide open because God is fixing to speak to you. And if you've got enough faith to reach up and grasp it, it won't just be illumination. It won't just be information. But virtue and life will flow out of his word. And a miracle can come your way. Yeah. 
Did you ever watch kids practicing softball and maybe a coach or some adult was out there hitting them fly balls? Now, you know, some of them be out there, they'll have their glove laying on the ground and chasing the butterfly, you know. But the ones that really want to play, come on, coach, hit me one. You ever seen that attitude? Come on, just hit me one. Just hit one somewhere in the vicinity, and I'll run it down if I have to. Hey, you know what? That's how we need to be when we come to God's house and the man of God stands up to preach. We need to have our Holy Ghost glove up and say, just get one somewhere in my vicinity. Just get, I might have to run one down. I might have to dive on it to keep it from getting away. But there ain't nothing going to stop me from getting my word tonight. Let's all stand. I feel like hitting somebody one tonight. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hey, how many of you tonight could use a renewing in the Holy Ghost? We're going to start with this because this is easy. We know this is the will of God. Now, I know we all shouldn't raise our hands and say, yeah, yeah, we always need a renewing in the Holy Ghost. But I'm telling you, if there's somebody here tonight, and there is somebody here tonight, that you came to this place dry and thirsty. And it's been too long since the Spirit of God has wrung you out. And you're beginning to worry about yourself because you're not feeling what you want to feel. I've got a word for you. Get your glove up. I'm fixing to hit you one. Come on now. And when you hear the word, you know what you need to do? You've got to respond. Faith has always got an action involved with it. Faith without works is dead. You've got to worship. You've got to say something. You've got to, you got to make some kind of a response to let God know, yes, that's me. I claim that. Yeah. I'm fixing to hit you one. You know what the scripture said? Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to it.